Chapter 29, The Search for Order in an Era of Limits, 1973-1980. So we're talking about the 1970s here. So the 70s was a decade that was like a 1960s hangover. Uh, you know, so much had happened in the 60s, and then it was just kind of over. Um, Vietnam ended, the civil rights movement, you know, regarded any group, quieted way down. You know, crazy politics, revolutionaries, and they had nothing to revolt about anymore. So the 70s was like an opposite of the 60s. Peace and love was replaced with the me decade, more of a self-serving, kind of selfish, take care of your own decade. But truly, politics would never be the same. So your your chapter uh, uh, years start at 1973, and this would be the Watergate scandal. So as we'll see, the Watergate scandal will paint this decade and truly be the turning point in American history where where the people, the citizens, really stop trusting their government. And from that point on, we 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 you know approach voting and politicians and and government in a completely different way. Um, and and replace <clears throat> replace with the distrust of the government. You know, baby boomers stopped trusting the people in charge because of what happened in the 60s. <clears throat> culminating in, of course, the Watergate scandal. Uh, and because of the distrust, it led to eras uh, since, including today, that demand we demand more transparency from our government. So remember, the feelings changed from the greatest generation, you know, believing in the honor of the government and would support anything they suggested, like supporting the war in Vietnam. <clears throat> But the baby boomers, their children, start to question authority, and, and the entire fabric of the nation changes. In the 1970s, the economy faltered greatly. Uh, there was no longer a war to fuel the economy. So we've talked about, about this. You know, wars are good for economies. But when they stop, although we didn't see it in World War II for a different reason, but typically when they stop and all that war production comes to an end, the, the economy sags. Um, so that's what happened in the 70s. Uh, the general feeling in the 70s was depression and a general negativity. I mean, that's, that's very, a, a very general kind of uh, description. I can tell you from my own personal experience, because I was young, but I, I came of age in the 70s. I, I grew up in the 70s. I graduated high school in 1974. So I look back very fondly on the 70s as my time. Uh, but without question, not the same as the 60s or 50s, and, and different from what was coming. So, so a, a bit of a bit of a, of a you know lag and a letdown for 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 a period of time. And it all has to do with the, with the hangover from the war and the and the counterculture and all of that. Okay, <clears throat> let's start our class today with a film. Please watch the crash course film entitled Ford Carter and the Economic Malaise, and then come on back. Okay, so so the Watergate scandal is is the big one for for this uh, this decade. Okay, um, it's known as the Watergate scandal because it happened at a hotel called the Watergate. So so again, that that's the only reason why there, there's there's no you know significance or relevance to the name except for that's where the Democratic headquarters uh, were located that got broken into that would is known as the Watergate <clears throat> break-in. So this would prove to be the rotten cherry on the top of Nixon's administration and ultimately would drive him to resign. Uh, so so what, what happened in this event? Uh, January, I'm sorry, June 17th, 1972, you, you have a break-in at the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Watergate Hotel. Uh, five men were arrested for breaking into the, into the committee. Uh, so initially written off as an amateuristic burglary, but then it was determined that two of the of the men <clears throat> were for, the burglars were former CIA and FBI. So from the very start, it looked very suspicious. 1972 was an election year. You know Nixon's running for for re-election. He he was elected in '68. Now he's running for re-election in in '72. So when the FBI and CIA were involved, he was immediately asked if he knew of this event. And he, he said, no, I don't know anything about this at all. This would later prove to be, proved out to have been a blatant lie, the first of many, many lies. 
But Nixon running for a second term was hugely popular because he was de-escalating the Vietnam War. So although a conservative and a Republican, the young people kind of started jumping ship, stopped being revolutionaries and jumped on Nixon's bandwagon because he's going to stop the war. That's all young people really wanted. Um, <clears throat> He was running against a man named George McGovern, a senator from South Dakota, a liberal Democrat running on the anti-war return of prisoners of war of Vietnam. He called for amnesty for draft evaders. So, of course, you know, many young men in the 60s went to Canada to escape the draft or just burnt their draft cards and, and didn't show up. So here's McGovern as this war is winding down, talking about you know, giving them amnesty, letting them back. Of course, this lost him the conservative British generation vote uh, immediately. You know, they were not ready to forgive draft daughters who went to Canada. They, they thought they saw them as cowards. Uh, <clears throat> he, he also campaigned on a, on a huge reduction of the military. Uh, this also was not popular with the greatest generation. OK. Uh, <clears throat> So as we'll see, McGovern didn't didn't prove to be much of a threat to Nixon in '72. Um, so so Nixon himself is is a really interesting guy in American history, going back to the you know '40s, you know really the post World War II era all the way through you know till the mid 1970s. He will be a very impactful person, um, <clears throat> uh, famously and infamously, okay, negatively and positively. So let's do a supplemental lecture here, number 14 on Richard Nixon. Um, so essentially what we're doing here, I'm going to talk to you about the chronology of, of his missteps, okay? Uh, and uh, let's look at our outline. Okay, number one, known for its part in Watergate. Without question, when you think of Nixon, you think of Watergate, um, especially if you're from that era. Uh, but the question is, why did he bother with this? I mean, he didn't need to, as we'll see. But the truth is he had a very long history of questionable behavior. What is that history, number two? And I'm going to give you all these points. So there's a lot of them, but you don't have to write you know, a book about each one. Just give me the, the main points and go on to the next one. But make sure you get them all, okay? But the problem with this essay many times for students is they skip some. So you're going to get points off if it's on an outline and, and you don't write about it. Okay, McCarthy, Joseph McCarthy, checkers. What does that mean? Debate, corrupt election. Paris, Cambodia, China, okay? And number three, of course, Watergate, the break-in. What's the significance or who are Woodward and Bernstein and what were their significance? And then, of course, as always, the relevance at the end, okay? Okay, let's get started. So, so Nixon is mostly known for his role in what was called the Watergate break-in. Uh, as Watergate was unfolding, the incident in 1972, Nixon was running for re-election. But truly, there was never much of a threat to Nixon to not win that election. George McGovern wasn't going to win him no matter what he tried to do. Nixon was going to win. There's no question about it. And as I said, many young people were supporting him now. And remember, there was a surge of conservatism in the country, and Nixon was seen as the leader of that movement. So Nixon wins a landslide victory in 1972, beating McGovern. Um, <clears throat> So as this as this Watergate story is unfolding, this this election is happening. The Watergate elect uh, Watergate break-in happened in June and of '72, and of course the election was in November, and it didn't really have much of an effect on the election as it happened. But once he was elected and, and all the information started coming out, you know, it starts to unfold, and of course it's hard to not ask the question. Why would Nixon bother to, to do all that he did to, to get information about McGovern? He didn't have to do anything. He was going to beat him. So why put yourself at risk? You know, why, why, why do something illegal that might lose you the presidency when you didn't, you didn't have to do that? So, of course, it's hard not to ask that question. Why would he go through all this? He didn't need to. Nixon didn't need any intelligence about McGovern. McGovern never really had a chance. But this is who this man was. And I mentioned before, he was a narcissist. And he, he was obsessed with himself and his place in history, King, King Richard. Okay, He wanted to orchestrate his administration to be one of the greats. Uh, <clears throat> we remember Barry Goldwater, the, the uh, ultra-conservative leader of the Republican Party, 
from the uh, mid 60s. And here's a quote uh, from him about Nixon. I've characterized Nixon as a loner, a cold man with great self-confidence and a one track mind centered on the advancement of Richard Nixon. OK, so perhaps not the uh, you know, nicest of men, a little bit a little bit obsessed with himself. <laughs> Uh, but the truth is, he'd been a controversial person in politics since the beginning. Nixon had a long and checkered political career. Okay, so let's go through them here one by one. He had been a supporter of Joseph McCarthy. Uh, and there you see him on the on the right, you know, hunting for communists, uh, ruining people's lives, you know, destroying careers, uh, you know, uh, the army, the, uh, I'm sorry, the military, the entertainment business. The government that you know, McCarthy had lists of communists and he brought them all all to, to uh, hearings in front of the Senate. And, you know, at that time, this was seen as the right thing because the entire country was anti-communist. And we've talked about the two red scares and the and the, you know, the anti-communist fervor and the containment and fear and Truman Doctrine and, you know, this this absolute obsession and fear of communism in the 20th century. Uh, but today, from today's lens, looking back, we, we don't look fondly on McCarthy and his followers. We see them as zealots and people that ruin people's lives. So Nixon was one of those people, okay? <clears throat> uh, later, Nixon would run for vice president under Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, during the campaign, Nixon was accused of improprieties regarding campaign funds. A sum of $18,000 in cash was missing. And it looked like maybe he just pocketed it. Uh, so, of course, Eisenhower gets very angry at him and says, you know, you fix this or I'm going to kick you off this ticket. So Nixon made a special speech to America on TV. So understand, it's 1952. TV's brand new, like hardly, you know, hardly getting, getting, getting started. Uh, so on, in, this, in this address to the American public, he claims innocent in the affair. Uh, uh, he didn't, in a sense, he, that he didn't do this, uh, that he was not keeping any of the funds for himself. And this became known as the checkers speech. So you, you need to tell me why it's called the checkers speech, okay? Uh, please watch the two films here back to back. Richard Nixon, checkers speech number one. Richard Nixon's, Nixon's checkers speech number two. Uh, please watch those two back to back. And I want you to... Look at him, his demeanor, his body language, and tell me if you believe him or if you think he's lying, okay? So go ahead and watch those two uh, films and then come on back. So very interesting. I, I, uh, was it wrong for me to take that money? He's saying he didn't take it, but then he, was it wrong for me to do that? Um, but, of course, he, he makes this kind of cheesy attempt to, to, to spin it a different way by saying we're going to keep – the dog checkers because my little girl loves the dog. So we're going to keep that, that, uh, that, um, you know, contribution from a, from a, um, from a person. Okay. Uh, so interesting. Um, now I would say that most, most people today look at this speech and say, I don't trust him, but most people then did. And this really did get him off the hook and he was able to stay on the camp on the campaign with Eisenhower and they won two terms. So Nixon was vice president for eight years with uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. <clears throat> okay, in 19 in 1960, uh, Nixon gets his own chance. He's in, he's going to run for president now. Dwight's done with his two terms. Nixon runs for president against John Kennedy, and very famously had a, a debate with him. So you know debates are part of our lives today, but back then not so. It, it was still kind of new. Being on television was still kind of new. Uh, Kennedy seemed to understand the power of TV. He looked young and vibrant. He looked regal, you, you know, young and handsome. Uh, Nixon was sweating. He had shaved that day. He had a five o'clock shadow, they called it. Uh, so he came up as disheveled and untrustworthy. And so, you know, so again, the people are seeing him in that in that light like they've seen him with checkers. Uh, so Kennedy won a very close election, uh, and many historians believe that this debate was the incident that pushed people to Kennedy because, because people didn't trust Nixon. Uh, 
So, what, interesting information about this election. There's some evidence, and I would say it has been nearly accepted as fact today, that there was fraud in the 1960 election. So in our present day, we talk about fraud in 2016. Yeah, you know, there was uh, potential fraud. The Russians were involved throwing the election. 2020, you know, Donald Trump is is accusing um, the you know uh, election fraud. Uh, but 1960 was different times, and this is probably fraud. Uh, you know, that you wouldn't probably wouldn't see today because I don't think anybody would get away with it with, with it like you could back then, 60 years ago. So Joseph Kennedy was John Kennedy's father, very, very wealthy man, very influential, had politicians in his pocket. This, this is a, you know, a, a power broker kind of guy. Uh, and it, it's believed that, that Kennedy's people fixed the vote in Texas and Illinois, giving John Kennedy those states 51 electoral votes and a majority in the Electoral College. So he wins, but because his father threw the election. Uh, Joe, Joe Kennedy was obsessed with his oldest son becoming the president. And then his oldest son, Joseph Kennedy Jr., was killed in World War II. So next up was Jack or John Kennedy. I don't think that John Kennedy was that excited about ever being the president, but his father pushed him. So now potentially his father threw the election uh, his way. Uh, so was Nixon robbed? of the presidency in 1960. Many, many historians today believe so. When asked about what would you like to do, Mr. Nixon, about this fraud, he said nothing. I, I fear to question the results would harm the country. So Nixon did not mount a challenge. But many conservatives and Nixon apologists then and today point at that decision as an indication of Nixon's true character not Watergate is still years away, okay? But I, I ask you, if you were running for president and you went through, you know, the, first of all, you served as vice president for eight years. Now you're running running yourself. You spend all that money. You go on all those stops and all, all those speeches and campaign stops, and you're out there, you know, pushing for the vote. If you then lost a very, very close, like one of the, one of the closest elections in history, if you lost a close election and then heard that your opponent may have cheated, would you say, oh, no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not going to worry about it. I don't want to harm the country. Heck no. You'd be screaming at the top of your lungs. Let's find out. Let's get to the bottom of this. You know, America's not so delicate and fragile that we can't handle something like that. That's who we are. But Nixon says, no, I don't want to investigate it. So, so some people believe that it was perhaps because he had things to hide and that perhaps he had done things in this election that, that, that were illegal. And he was concerned that an investigation would make, would perhaps find out that John Kennedy cheated, but also would find out that he cheated, okay? Uh, so, but he doesn't win the election. But eight years later, he does. He becomes the president in 1968. And and very astutely, you see there on the right, he's got the peace sign. That, that was a symbol of the young generation. It wasn't the his generation. But Nixon tries to, you know, identify himself with the young people by – by showing the peace sign, but 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 peace with honor. So what does that mean? It means that you're going to win this Vietnam War. Uh, we're, we're not going to just walk away. We're, we're not going to abandon them. We're, we're going to perhaps come to a, a ceasefire, but it'll be with honor. Okay. Um, okay, so let me find my place here. So Nixon wins the presidency on this end the war campaign. But then we also learned how he sabotaged the 1968 Paris peace talks, resulting in 22,000 American men dying in those next five years. He then secretly began bombing Cambodia after the Tet Offensive. Uh, so I know we've talked about those two before, Paris and Cambodia, but it's in your outline, so mention them, okay? <clears throat> so it's felt that because of Nixon's campaign to escalate that war, instead of ending it as, as it promised, it it cost as many as 15,000 more U.S. soldiers dying and probably half a million Vietnamese and Cambodians. <clears throat> so, of course, people did not always trust Nixon. He always seemed to be on the on the side of what's that man up to instead of instead of trust. OK. The apex of his administration was his part in the opening of relations with communist Red China. This was a tremendous victory for him. We, we talked about. 
uh, Red China became communist after World War II, one of those proxy wars that that Truman didn't respond to, and and, and Red China was was uh, you know taken over and become communist. So so a former ally is now an enemy. So since World War II, there hadn't been any real trade or communication with China because of course they're communists. But Nixon takes it upon himself to push an open relations. This was this is the this is the shining moment for him in his in his uh, administration. Uh, and so again, what his followers and you know the supporters, conservative people, they point to this also, um, you know, like like not questioning the 1960 election as as a true measure of his character that he's a man of character. But of course, the topper in his career was Watergate, the Watergate Hotel. So don't forget, Watergate's just simply the name of the hotel where it happened. <clears throat> Uh, so re remember, Nixon had a huge ego, uh, and he was trying to orchestrate his administration so it would rank right up there with Washington, Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt. <clears throat> so he decided to install a secret recording system in the Oval Office to record every conversation that was had there. So if the phone rang and he picked it up, that would that would start the recording. If he was sitting in his office and somebody came in and started to talk, it was voice activated. So wh wh whatever was said in that office was being recorded. Uh, why, why would he do that? Um, because, he, he again, he saw himself as this great man. It was going to be one of the greats in history. So he wanted to have you know access to everything he ever said. So when he finishes his two terms, he could publish his memoirs. And, and of course, everybody would want to read that. Uh, this would come back to haunt him because this this is where, as the Watergate incident unfolded, this this is where they would hear him actually, you know, uh, they they called called it the smoking gun, you know, evidence that you, that you can't refute. He 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 clearly speaks of knowledge of the event after telling the American public that he didn't know anything about it. So so the the the, the tape recording system in in the Oval Office would be his undoing and force him to finally resign. Uh, so why why do this break in? You know, again, that was one of the questions I asked in the introduction. Why would you bother? You didn't need to do this. But again, it's 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 obsession, fear, paranoia, narcissism. The break in was to steal top secret documents and wiretap the phones of the committee headquarters. Uh, <clears throat> Nixon then took steps after the event to cover it up, including paying hush money. <clears throat> to the burglars, pay them off to, to, to stay quiet. This, this is the United States president. Uh, he tried to stop the FBI from investigating <clears throat> and you know, using his presidential powers to limit the FBI. <clears throat> he destroyed evidence and he fired uncooperative staff members, anything to protect himself. And the whole country was watching him do it. I mean, it was pretty clear what, what was going on. But at some point, you know, it was just kind of dying out and, and potentially because of Lack of evidence or just lack of investigation, perhaps it would have died away and 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 died out, <clears throat> and it would just be a footnote in history. But two men, two Washington Post reporters named Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, uh, they they dig in and work hard and research and investigate this. Uh, <clears throat> they would ultimately write a book called All the President's Men and win the Pulitzer Prize for it. So there's the book on the left, but that book then became a, a top selling movie, popular movie also in 19, I believe it was uh, 76. <clears throat> so much of their information came from an anonymous reform uh, um, informer, I'm sorry. So when it was all said and done, the, the tapes, and it's a long story, you, you could write a book about Watergate. <clears throat> the, the, the tapes were, his secret White House tapes were found out, the, the Senate subcommittee, Asked him to, you know, give us those. He said no. They fought about that for months. He was finally forced to give them up, and that was the end for him when they when they heard those tapes. So Nixon becomes the first president in American history to resign. So a shameful moment, and this this man falls from grace in a huge way. August 1974, uh, after his role in Watergate became public knowledge, uh, he was finished. <clears throat> Who steps in as the next president? Uh, Gerald Ford. Uh, and one of the first things that Gerald Ford did was pardon Nixon for all crimes he committed or may have committed. 
So understand at the time, I mentioned before, the, the Watergate incident is kind of the official end of the 60s era. Young people fighting against the man and, and, the, and these corrupt people, you know, uh, we, we didn't like Johnson. Now Nixon's lying to us. So uh, the young people were thrilled to, to topple him. It was like a victory. But then, boom, this happens. And it took the air out of everything because now this man can't be can't be convicted for crimes because he definitely committed crimes that could have put him in jail. So never prosecuted to the anger of many. He had broken the law. He had used the power of the presidency for personal gain. He lied to the American public, and he's going to get off scot-free. He would live the rest of his life, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, 20, 30 more years anyway. Uh, he had he lived in a in a a palatial estate on the on the cliffs above uh, San Clemente. Uh, he was given uh, a multi-million dollar signing bonus to write his memoirs. Uh, he would become kind of an elder statesman and an advisor to presidents until he finally passed away. So breaks the law, lies to the American public, does everything a president shouldn't do, abused his power for his own personal gain, and then Except for the fact, of course, he fell from grace and was shamed. He, he lived a pretty nice life for the rest of his life. So history looks back at him and calls him Tricky Dicky. You can't trust him. And again, the biggest question is why? You didn't have to worry about that election. Why take that risk? Again, just a huge ego and a control freak. Very paranoid about his enemies closing in on him. He, he wanted to gain an advantage always, even if it was illegal. And I've shown you, you know, the, the chronology of his career was always a little shady, okay? So Tricky Dicky is, is what uh, people remember him uh, as being. So this, this incident, uh, as I said, you know, unofficially closes the 60s era and the 70s era, begins the complete opposite, much more bleak than the 60s. But the key here is that most of the people in the country after Watergate change from being so trustful of the government and you don't trust the government. And from that point on, and, and we, we're very much like that today, we don't trust them at all uh, until they can show us that we can. Uh, very, It's the opposite of what was the 40s, 50s, and 60s. We trusted all of them. Now we don't trust any of them because of Watergate. Okay, okay to end the lecture, the relevance, <clears throat> the Watergate scandal changed American politics forever ending the do not question authority point of view. Today, as a result, Americans question their leadership and think more critically about the presidency. One more time, relevance. The Watergate scandal changed American politics forever, ending the do not question authority point of view. Today, as a result, Americans question their leadership and think more critically about the presidency. Okay, that is the end of Supplemental Election Number 14 on Richard Nixon. So let's keep moving on here. So Gerald Ford becomes the next president. Nixon's vice president takes over for, for Nixon. Uh, an interesting uh, administration. Uh, probably not a bad guy. But, of course, he pardoned Nixon. And that, that really was like committing political suicide for himself. Because he pardoned Nixon... There's no, there's no way he was going to be elected president in 1976. So a very short, in, inconsequential administration, although very interestingly, two assassination attempts against Ford only weeks apart, both by women. Uh, neither, neither one uh, were successful, of course. Uh, so Jimmy Carter comes along. And uh, one more thing about Ford, one of the few presidents that never was voted in office, he he took over for Nixon and lost in 76. So he's the 38th president, but not one person voted for him, okay? So Carter becomes the president, 39th president in 76. Jimmy Carter beats Gerald Ford. Um, he, would, he would largely have an ineffective one term. Uh, you know, the economy was in bad shape. That's what he'll be remembered for. We'll talk more about Carter in the next chapter. So the 70s was mostly no, known for the energy crisis. Uh, there was a shortage of oil. Uh, is that possible? Um, well, at least that's what OPEC was saying. Okay, OPEC was saying we're short of oil. So who is OPEC? 
the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, mostly Middle Eastern countries. Uh, it turns out that there wasn't a shortage of oil. OPEC was just claiming to America that there was a shortage in retaliation for the United States supplying Israel in a war against Arabic nations. So in, in response, in the United States, gas prices skyrocketed, and they haven't stopped since. Because prior to this, gas was cheap, cheap, cheap. Gas was, you know, 29 cents a gallon. Uh, and you had big V8 cars that were large because you didn't care. You weren't worried about gas mileage. That, that all changes here. Uh, so because of this shortage, uh, there were gas lines and gas stations were running out of gas and people were hoarding gas. And they finally came up with this idea that if your license plate ended in an odd number, you could only get gas on odd number days and vice versa even. Uh, there were long lines. It took hours to get gas. So if you, if you get gas at Costco and you, and you, and you wait 10, 15 minutes sometime today, very much like that, but maybe 100 times worse. And I'm not even kidding. I'm talking about, I'm talking about gas lines maybe a mile long going down the street. Uh, so, of course, in, a tip, in typical American fashion, young students see an opportunity. Uh, if you're a businessman and you need to get your, ga your, your car filled up for a business meeting, it's going to take you four hours to do it. That's, that's half your day. So business people started hiring students and pay them you know, money to sit in line and get gas for them because the students could study while they're waiting in line. So, of course, the very much American ingenuity just never seems to, you know, it always pops up even in the worst of situations. OK. Um, OK. So this is this is a this is the 70s. Like I said, a, a, a hangover and everything kind of kind of kind of, you know, turns turns the opposite of all the optimism and hope of the 60s. So they, they decided to change the national speed limit nationwide on every highway to 55 miles an hour. Mm. So I challenge you, uh, go out in the 78 freeway or wherever you're at, the 15, and get in the slow lane. I would do this at night when there's no one around. Get in the slow lane, because if you do it in the fast lane, you'll be run over. Get in the slow lane and drive five miles doing 55 miles an hour. And tell me if you don't think that you can run that fast, okay? I'm kidding, but that's slow. It is difficult to stay at 55 miles an hour. That's just, you're just creeping along. But that became the law. And if you were doing 57, they'd pull you over, okay? So cars began to, to be built to be energy efficient like they are today. We became concerned about better gas mileage, all to conserve oil. We're all we're concerned about trying to conserve oil, okay? Uh, <clears throat> So, you know, people start to think of the environment and what are we doing to our environment? What are we doing to the earth? You know, we're just we're just getting all this oil out of the ground and we're using it, burning it. We don't care. Maybe we should maybe we should start thinking about conservation and preservation. OK, let's do a, a supplemental lecture here um, talking about environmentalism. But we'll actually call this no nukes, uh, number 15, no nukes. OK. So what does that mean? Uh, our outline, uh, introduction, uh, environmentalism in the 60s, kind of the, the movement starts there and it overflows into the 70s. We're talking about nuclear power and, of course, the movement against it was called no nukes. The incidents that you need to tell me about if you choose this to write about, if it's a choice, the China Syndrome, that was a movie. And then the incidents that happened at these, at these plants, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima Daiichi, and San Onofre. What were the positives of the no nukes movement? The Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and Earth Day. And of course, the relevance at the end. Okay. Okay, let's get started. So, the no nukes movement kind of brought back to light the idea of environmentalism that related to 1960s values, the young people getting back to the earth, becoming natural. And, and you start talking about preservation and conservation. The greatest generation is destroying the land. Remember, the Native Americans said that about the Europeans. All they do is destroy the land. They, 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 they don't tread lightly on it. They don't respect it. And, and you could argue that Americans still do that today. Uh, but people start to think we need to preserve and conserve. It, it's still a, a huge topic of debate today. Global warming you know, becomes political. Both sides are for or against it, and you fight. You fight each other while the, while the you know globe continues to warm. 
um, so this is kind of reaching back to Teddy Roosevelt and 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 even even Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal, where, where they you know responded to to the environment and trying to preserve. So in the 70s, in the 60s, uh, the the environmental movement was in response to oil spills and overpopulation and the threat of nuclear war. Uh, it moved people to be concerned <clears throat> with the state, <clears throat> excuse me, the state of the planet. It was brought into sharper view with the accident at Three Mile Island. So I'm I'm still in the intro here. I'm going to talk about Three Mile Island uh, in your outline a little bit later. I'm just pointing out this is the kind of turning point that that really galvanized the, the no nukes movement, uh, and we'll talk about why here in a minute. So so nuclear power had become very popular uh, post World War II. So we remember. Nuclear uh, bombs ended that war, but nuclear power becomes very, very popular, and which seen as a clean and efficient method of power <clears throat> that would, in the 70s, offset the oil shortage. And and it's totally true. When when it's working well, nuclear power is a very, very uh, efficient method of creating power. But there's one small problem: a mistake could be deadly for millions of people, depending on where where you're at. A reactor meltdown would dump deadly radioactive waste into the atmosphere and potentially kill hundreds of thousands or millions of American people. So young people looking for an issue, looking for an issue they, that they had lost since the 60s now find the next bandwagon to jump on. And the no nukes movement became very popular. Uh, again, mostly baby boomers, but also now their children are involved. It's, you know, time's moving on here. Uh, <clears throat> So no nukes became the, the, the next big cause, the, the baby boomers up in arms and, and protesting. It was like the good old days, it was like the 60s all over again. The greatest generation, of course, are against it. They condoned nuclear power as the future. Uh, don't worry about meltdowns. That will never happen. It's, it's too safe. It's not going to happen. Okay, so the greatest generation and the baby boomers are at it again. The baby boomers saying, we question authority. We don't like this idea. We don't trust it. It's going to kill people. No, the great generation. No, it's fine. Don't worry about it. The government says so. So we're back to the same old story again. In the midst of this movement, a movie came out from Hollywood, The China Syndrome, 1979. So why is it called The China Syndrome? Well, it's symbolic, not real. But uh, essentially... When, it, when the core melts, if, if you have a meltdown in a reactor, the core melts through its containment structure, the concrete, and it goes through the bottom and it hits the earth and it tunnels deep into the earth. So the idea uh, that a nuclear accident or a meltdown at a plant would result in nothing stopping it from tunneling its way to the other side of the world or to China. Of course, that would never happen, but it's, it's, it's symbolic. The, the point is, it's it's bad. When the, when, if the if the reactor melts down and that and that uh, radioactive waste gets out into the in the exposure of people, it's going to be bad. It's going to be spraying up into the air and tunneling into the earth, uh, making everything around it around it you know uh, full of radiation. <clears throat> uh, so what kind of effect would that have on the environment? It's going to be awful. Okay, but but again, nobody worried. Uh, Greatest Generation said that's that's just a dumb Hollywood movie. It's not. It's liberal nonsense. It's just a dumb Hollywood movie with Jane Fonda. She's a liberal. Don't listen to her. It'll never happen. But so nobody worried, except for young people. Plans for hundreds of plants were in the works, and then it did happen. There 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 was a a, a meltdown. The meltdown became a reality at Three Mile Island. Uh, March 28, 1979, a minor cooling system malfunction caused a partial meltdown at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, damaged one of the reactors. Now, truthfully, in this case, very little radiation was released. They contained it early. Uh, little radiation was released into the environment because of the surrounding primary containment vessel. So there was no deaths, no radiation sickness that had been officially attributed to the meltdown at Three Mile Island. But the accident caused public concern. This this movie, uh, The China Syndrome, had just come out. And everybody was, oh, that's nonsense. Twelve days after this movie came out, and everybody was saying that this will never happen, it happened. Okay, so not, not, not the greatest generation's shiny moment for sure. So while, while it wasn't a... a 
a catastrophe, it did cause public concern and awareness grew. There we go again. Awareness is always growing. And more people were anti-nuke and joined the no-nukes movement. <clears throat> Many of the new plants that were being planned were now being deauthorized. Um, <clears throat> so the movement had its, had an impact. Was was there any other nuclear meltdown? <clears throat> yeah, there has been. Uh, Chernobyl in Russia, in Ukraine, August, April 26, 1986, is the world's worst nuclear disaster when an explosion of a nuclear power plant unleashed 200 times more radioactivity then the Hiroshima and Nagasaki nuclear bombs combined. 200 times more radiation hit the atmosphere than what happened in these two cities at the end of the war. <clears throat> this affected forever the lives of 7 million people. Because the symptoms can take years before they appear. If you are not in the impact zone, you're a mile or two away. The radiation is still in the atmosphere. It hits you. Your body absorbs it. But it might be 10 years before you get cancer and die from it. So it's not something that you could really, you know, uh, quantify as this happened because of, of this meltdown. Uh, <clears throat> when the incident happened, 30 people were killed, two immediately and 28 within a month from, from acute radiation poisoning. But since that time, it's hard to tell how many people have died in 30, uh, what, what is it, 34 years uh, or so. Um, uh, because cancer is so prevalent in our in our societies today, you know, because people die of cancer, you can't say that that happened because of Chernobyl. So it's hard to quantify. But yet, it, very interesting uh, statistic here. There's been 7,000 incidents of thyroid cancer in the Chernobyl area. This is a very unusual and rare type of cancer that you don't see very often. But yet 7,000 people that were living near Chernobyl have died of thyroid cancer. So chances are, okay, um, I don't know if that could ever be proven, but come on, the, the, the evidence points to it, okay? <clears throat> and here's the, here's the worst part. After it's all said and done, and you see the explosion here in the image, the entire reactor exploded, and all that, all that uh, radiation went up in the air and, of course, through the ground. Uh, but only 3% of the radioactive material in the Chernobyl reactor went into the atmosphere. Only 3%. So what does that mean? It means that, that the other 97% is still contained there today. So you can't go near Chernobyl. Nobody lives within miles of this place. It is absolutely quarantined off. Animals, people, <clears throat> nothing's there. It's a wasteland because you can't get near it because it's oozing radioactivity as we speak. The only people that can go in there, you have to have a, a you know a huge hazmat suit on. Uh, that's all you can do. It's been, it's completely destroyed the environment for you know many many square miles, and nobody lives anywhere near there. <clears throat> it used to be a thriving community, but this this destroyed it. They they've actually built this huge lead shield that that is the same size and conforms to the wreckage that you see here. They built railroad tracks that were probably half a mile long so they 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 built the lead cover a half a mile away or whatever it is uh, some distance to not be near the radiation then when they were finished they rolled it along the tracks and this big lead cover covered this whole erect that you see here so today this entire image you're seeing is covered with this big lead shield that they claim will <coughs> will will uh, keep it contained for a hundred years you know that's nice, but 100 years is 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 you know people's grandkids. What are they going to do with it? There's there's nothing you can do with radio radioactive waste. There's nowhere to store it. They have put it in plastic containers over the years and dumped it in the deepest parts of the ocean. So I don't know how many are down there, but there's plastic containers full of radioactive waste in the bottom of the ocean, probably trying to seep out as the plastic deteriorates. So you know this this is the problem with nuclear power. It's, it's efficient until there's a problem, and then what happens? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you got all this waste that is absolutely toxic and, and you know, fatal to people. So it's a problem. Uh, so in Chernobyl, you have a deteriorating concrete shell that's, that remains inside the damaged reactor. It deteriorates a little more today. 
or as the years go by. So Chernobyl is is clearly one of the world's most dangerous ticking time bombs. We've kind of swept it under the rug, but it's got to be dealt with at some point, but nobody knows how to deal with it, so they cover it up with a lead shield. Uh, any any others? Not that long ago, 2011, or the huge earthquake in, in Japan caused a tsunami, a huge wave of over 100 feet uh, hit the eastern shore of the island. And the tsunami laid waste to it. Uh, the earthquake was so large that it actually moved the entire main island of Japan six feet to the east. The entire island moved six feet. That's how big this earthquake was. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there was there is a power plant on Japan's eastern shore. You see on the right there the map, the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Uh, plant. And here you see what happened to it. it looks a lot like Chernobyl, but maybe worse. Uh, so what happened is this big tsunami hit the hit the plant. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, and the power generators were quickly flooded. It knocked vital cooling systems offline. This caused reactor fuel rods to begin to melt down and leak deadly radiation into the surrounding area. Uh, so 16 hours into the disaster, the fuel rods in one reactor had almost completely melted with the other two close behind. But it would be another 88 days, almost three months, until the Japanese government finally admitted that a meltdown had occurred. They didn't want anybody to know. So while the entire Pacific Ocean is being bathed in radioactive material, they're, they're trying to pretend like nothing happened. But the American government did the same thing. American government took an optimistic stance. Not, not to worry. Don't worry about it. It's under control. We got it under control. Well, again, do we trust the government? Should we trust the government? Well, it turns out, no, it was not under control. And while the government's saying, don't worry about everything's fine, CNN and, and all the news stations are showing maps of the Pacific and this big, this big cloud of radiation that's coming across the Pacific towards the United States and hit, you know, the United States uh, West Coast uh, from top. I mean, it, it hit the entire North and South America. If you were in at the bottom of South America in Tierra del Fuego, you might have escaped it. But that that's uh that cloud of radiation that came from this this meltdown bathed uh United States in it and, and we all got got hit with that. Now the government says no, by the time it got here, it was, you know, it had been reduced in it in its in its strength, you know, from coming across the ocean. By the time it got here, it was it was not not hurtful. Well, you know, again, do we believe them? They're they're Japan's lying about it. America's pretending that nothing happened. Do we believe them? Okay. Uh, so this is the problem with um, <clears throat> nuclear power. Uh, the plant in Japan became the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. But what about our, our own power plant <clears throat> in, in San Diego County here, San Onofre, up the coast a little bit? Built in 1968. It's been around for a long time. But in 2012, eight years ago or so, it was found that wear in the plant was premature, and it raised eyebrows. Barbara Boxer, so who's she? She was a California senator. <clears throat> she claimed that San Onofre was unsafe and posed a danger to the 8 million people living within 50 miles of that plant. And uh, we are one of those, some of those 50, I'm sorry, 8 million people. That's that's because that it would have affected us greatly if something happened there. Uh so the plant was finally decommissioned in 2013 and, and closed down and stopped due to the failure of much of its equipment. So right down the street here, we, we got our own power plant that, that failed. So what's going on there today? They, they don't know what to do with this nuclear waste inside inside of these, these reactors. You know, inside of there is massive nuclear waste that could lay, wa uh, lay waste to all of us if it was, if it was released. How do we store it? What do we do with it? How do we dispose of it? They don't know. Okay, that's the problem with with nuclear power. <clears throat> but some positives came out of the movement. Um, I mean, besides, of course, you know, pretty pretty much an end to it. Also, the the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency was born of the no nukes movement. What is that? It forces developers to do an environmental study of their projects, whatever that project might be, a development. Maybe it's a tract of homes or a hospital, whatever it might be. They've got to do an environmental study first to see what the impact on the environment would be 
if if their if their project was approved. Uh, uh, also, Earth Day. Earth Day is a day every year where 20 million people or more, you know, call for a safer planet. So awareness, and people are more much more aware of it. Okay, the relevance of the lecture to end this. Uh, <clears throat> nuclear power had a very dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power brought awareness to the issue, and the state of the environment became important to people. So nuclear power is in serious decline today. One more time, relevance. Nuclear power had a very dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power brought awareness to the issue, and the state of the environment became important to people. So nuclear power is in serious decline today. Okay, so that is the end of Supplemental Lecture Number 15. No nukes. You've got one left. <laughs> okay, when we started this class, we talked about reconstruction. Then we went into the Industrial Revolution. We talked a lot about that, the, the, the start of the modern world that we live in today. But today, in America, in many places, we have deindustrialization. So, so what is that? Well, all these factories that were booming for so many years, and you know, whatever it might be, whatever you're manufacturing, steel, you know, uh, oil, whatever it is, uh, overseas competition and cheap labor caused many of these businesses to move out of America and go somewhere else. And this brought an end to American industries. And many towns that thrived in an industry, you know, became uh, just done. I can tell you my own personal family, most, most of my family's from Pittsburgh. Um, all my family's from Pittsburgh. And my cousins and aunts, I'm not aunts so much, uncles and, you know, and so on. Most of the male members, at least back when I was young, worked in the steel mills of Pittsburgh. They're everywhere. Uh, Pittsburgh was a filthy city in those days. It was belching black smoke everywhere because they're, they're doing steel. Uh, then suddenly they were gone, and everybody lost their jobs, their homes, uh, no money. Uh, very depressing. And then another part of the depressing aspects of the 70s. Uh, so these plants are now sitting empty in all these towns, uh, and this is—it's now called the Rust Belt. So here you see one that's just you know decaying away. It's, it's still there wherever this is. Uh, you, you go to these these uh, former industrial cities. And you see a lot of this. Uh, all the industry's gone. It's gone someplace else. Deserted plants and people out of work is a huge part of the 1970s. So I mentioned that the 70s was depressing on many levels. Uh, so back to politics. So so you have the, the you have the rise of conservative politics again because people are tired. Even after Nixon's missteps in in Watergate, although it did result in Carter for one term, uh, conservative politics continued. The liberalism of the Democratic Party did not gain that much from Watergate. Mm. Conservatism continued until Barack Obama just recently. Uh, and I mentioned before that Bill Clinton, you know, kind of being an exception, even though he was a liberal Democrat, he made very many conservative decisions. Well, what about civil rights? What happened to that? You know, Interests waned considerably after the 1960s. I mean, probably because there were so many gains. Uh, but for the most part, the the uh, movement kind of just came to a a, a halt. Uh, but there was an attempt to to uh, keep it alive, and this is called affirmative action. Mm -hmm. So, what what is affirmative action? A very controversial, you know, idea or legislation. So, affirmative action is to consider the disadvantages of minority groups and women and create an advantage for them. So you could you could say perhaps it's, it's somewhat like reparations. We talked about African Americans and Hispanic veterans coming back from World War II and being kept out of the of the wealth of real estate because they wouldn't give them home loans and 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 they wouldn't um they they weren't allowed to move to the suburbs because of deeds of covenant. Yeah, you know, that, that those are real live, you know, illegalities and unconstitutional actions that were done against a people. Uh, it's, it's against everything that we stand for, but it was done. Should, should we repay these people for being cut out like that? So that, that's what affirmative action's point of view was. Uh, you're trying to give advantages to people that have had disadvantages in the, in the past to, to get them on an equal footing that where they can compete with everybody else. 
So positions were set aside for minorities in, in business and in, in college entry. Uh, but of course, many white people scream, is, is this, isn't this reverse discrimination? Now suddenly because I'm white, I can't get a job because you have to hire five African Americans and five Hispanic Americans before you can hire me. And maybe I'm the most qualified, but it doesn't matter. You're going to hire them anyway. So, of course, this, this creates lots of controversy and lots of anguish. Uh, you know, a white person more qualified is being passed over to give a, a, a minority an opportunity. Um, if you're a minority, you might like that. If you're a white person, you may not. Uh, so affirmative action, you know, uh, why? Where did this come come up? Where, where did they come up with this? Progressive nations follow positive discrimination. It is a democratic process of development with just and equitable growth. This is this is the the pros of it. Uh, this is probably the the most pertinent one to provide employment opportunities to the marginalized for their economic liberalization. Okay, so that's the point right there, number three. Uh, that's what they're trying to do, level the playing field, okay? Uh, but but people fight back. A, a white man named uh, Jim Bakke, I'm sorry, Alan Bakke, uh, he sues the University of California system because uh, their admissions program was built to give all individuals an equal opportunity while creating a diverse student body. That's that's what it should be, okay? <clears throat> but Al, Alan Bakke says, no, my rights were, were violated when a lower qualified minority were accepted over him. <clears throat> well, he sues and he wins. And this pretty much brings affirmative action crashing to the ground is, uh, in California anyway. Uh, so the system was called in, into question, especially the quota system that called for certain numbers of minorities to be, to be admitted or hired, uh, regardless of their talent level, okay? Uh, so this was happening in employment, in college entrance, uh, the system was finally called into question and finally prohibited in California. Um, another important point of the 70s was the ERA movement, Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment was designed to give women the same rights as men in all aspects of society. But even in the 1970s, many wanted women to remain in their traditional roles in the home. Even women. On the right here, you see Phyllis Schlafly, a very conservative uh, you know, kind of right-wing woman, uh, very much instrumental in in this not passing. The feminist movement is just not compatible with happiness. They are not for equality. They want to kill everything masculine. So the pro-ERA people are are saying that that this, that the Constitution doesn't say anywhere that women have the same rights as men. So on the left, this is what what they want the amendment to say: equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged. By the United States or by any state on account of sex. Remember, going way back to the first chapter, uh, the 15th Amendment gave black men the vote, and women wanted it to say, uh, you know, add the word sex to it all so that anybody, regardless of your sex, could could, could vote. And they're still fighting for it almost 100 years later. This did, this did not pass because mostly because of conservatism and women like Phyllis Schlafly pushing that that women should stay stay in the kitchen, okay? Another controversial uh, incident in the 70s is Roe v. Wade, uh, the abortion um, uh, case here. Uh, so in the early 1960s, abortion was illegal. It was illegal to have an abortion. So if a woman was to get an abortion, she had to do it in a you know back room somewhere down a back alley with a questionable doctor. And that was done all the time. Uh, and many, many women died or got, uh, in, you know, infections. <clears throat> they bring it to court. Remember, set a precedent. And this landmark case claimed the, the, the Supreme Court said it was legal for a woman to get an abortion in her first trimester because it's her choice. It's her body. Uh, and that her choice was protected by rights to privacy. So even a 16-year-old girl could get an abortion and not have to tell her parents. It was her decision, her right. Uh, <clears throat> so, of course, the pro-choice, pro-life uh, argument begins. Um, did this put an end to it? No, it, it started it. It's still registered today. Uh, and you, you infuse religious aspects to it, thoughts about birth control. Yeah, this is controversial. Donald Trump um, has, you know, it, it, when he was president, uh, I, I guess he still is, but... Um, 
he threatened to end this. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna overturn Roe v. Wade uh, because he he's pushing a conservative agenda. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so this is a this is a still a, a controversial issue that that will probably not be resolved anytime soon. So I mentioned that, that religion was kind of infused into all of this, and and this idea of of morality and and what what was called what was called family values. <clears throat> so the conservative backlash against all of this, you know, results in the return to evan, evan, evangelism. Uh, mixing religion with politics, and we talked about that. You know, the the Constitution says you can't do that, but yet we see political leaders all the time. Uh, most of them do. You know, they they thank God, they bless the nation, God bless America. I, again, it's not against religion, but they're not supposed to do that because not everyone's a Christian or a Catholic or a, or a Jew. <clears throat> you you have freedom in this country to be what you want. So the president or a Political leaders shouldn't be up there condoning a religion when not everyone in the country is that has that belief. Okay, so mixing religion with politics and and calling it family values. So again, the First Amendment says that there's a there should be a separation between church and state. Not anti-religion. It's simply saying that the United States is not going to have a state religion that everybody has to has to follow. Uh, the this is right out of the Constitution, the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So you can't establish a religion, and you can't prohibit someone's religion. Um, but yet they, but yet we we see it every day. When anytime you see a political leader, Democrat or Republican, they, they typically are thanking God and God blessing the people of America. Uh, in 1972, uh, Vice President Dan Quayle, uh, George Bush Sr.'s vice president, he became kind of the family values, uh, you know, a proponent. So this is a, a, a Republican vice president. So if you look at him, well, this, this, of course, was back in those days. He's an old man today. But in those days, you look at him, who's he, who's he remind you of? He, he looks like John Kennedy a little bit. He's young, kind of handsome, vibrant. And the Republican Party was was you know jubilant. We, we we've got our own John Kennedy, and we're going to push this guy. He'll be the next president after Bush, and this is fantastic. Uh, and he's he becomes the 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 person that pushes for family values and that people should live a more religious life and 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 be more moralistic and 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 have family values. And this will come back to to bite him and this this would be the beginning of his downfall because he took it too far. So you see him on the left there. On the on the right, that's the actress Candace Bergen back in the back in this era, the nineties, early nineties. Uh on the TV show called Murphy Brown. So Murphy Brown was a very popular T V show. So she plays a forty something year old woman, a divorced news anchor. Uh, and she decides to have a child out of wedlock, which women do and have the perfect right to do then and now. Uh, and Dan Quayle decides to use this TV show to make an example about his family values approach. This is an excerpt from his speech. Bearing babies irresponsibly is simply wrong. Failing to support children one has fathered is wrong. We must be unequivocal about this. It doesn't help matters. When primetime TV has Murphy Brown, a character who supposedly epitomizes today's intelligent, highly paid professional woman, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. <clears throat> wow. So women across America become unglued. You know, who are you to tell us how to live? Who are you to tell us that we need a father to raise our child? Who are you to tell us that we need to have a family? Times are changing. Those those are old school traditions that maybe we all don't believe in anymore. So today we have we have marriages of two women raising children. We have marriages of two men raising children. This this is this did not you know go in line with with Dan Quayle's family values point of view. He's judging people in a free country. So of course people turn against him in mass. Uh, please watch the short film Murphy Brown versus Pri Vice President Dan Quayle. So as you see, this this argument going on in this time with Quayle versus a TV show character. Murphy Brown's not real. 
the person was Candace Bergen, but Candace Bergen and the network that did that show used used her TV show as a as a vehicle to fight against Quail, and it was quite effective. Uh, so Quail's argument was that Murphy Brown was sending the wrong message that single parents should not be encouraged. Who are you to tell us that, young women? In, in these situations, who are you to tell me I can't raise a child by myself? Uh, this erupted into a major campaign controversy. And as we'll see, right, I'm gonna, you're going to look at a couple of films here about Dan Quayle, and we'll talk about him in the next chapter. Dan, Dan Quayle just, just very somewhat quickly falls from grace and becomes, he, he goes from being the next John Kennedy to a, a laughing stock, and is mostly looked look back on it with disdain today. Um, please watch the next two films. The first one is called How to Lose the Presidency. Dan Quayle misspells potato. So Dan Quayle, the vice president, goes with his wife to an elementary school on you know TV. To, there's the president, the vice president, mixing with the kids. And during his visit, there's a spelling contest. And one boy spells potato. And Dan Quayle says, you spelled it wrong. There's an E at the end. No, there's not. There's not an E at the end of potato. There's, there's an E. If it's potatoes, it'd be E-S, but there's no E. It's P-O-T-A-T-O. -T -T and this is caught on live film, live TV. And the entire country sees that Dan Quayle can't spell potato. He's the vice president. Uh, watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so the next one, watch the next film, very short. Uh, the film is entitled Iconic Year No Jack Kennedy Debate Moment. And this was a vice presidential debate as the 92 election was approaching where the vice president's debate. And here you see Dan Quayle comparing himself to John Kennedy. In fact, he even saying he's got more qualifications than John Kennedy. I understand John Kennedy, especially then, I mean, time's moving on now, but John Kennedy still fresh in people's minds, even in the early 90s. It, it'd been less than 30 years. And if you were alive in that era, it, it still affects you. Um, John Kennedy was seen as a legend and someone you couldn't touch, deified. And here's Dan Quayle, who's already made a fool of himself in some cases. Now Dan Quayle's not only liking himself himself to John Kennedy, but almost saying I'm more qualified than John Kennedy. And then, of course, you see his opponent's reaction, a very famous reaction. You're no Jack Kennedy. Let's go ahead and watch that film. Okay, but, but the, the point is, in the 70s, 80s, early 90s, I'm, I'm truly starting with Reagan. Um, uh, the religious right uh, starts to gain in America. Uh, conservative politicians using family values and a return to religion to do what as a vehicle to get votes? Are, are they are they sincere? Are they real? Or are they just trying to get votes? Uh, is this right? Is this the way it should be? We talked about the amendment, the First Amendment. The First Amendment says no. Don't mix politics with with religion. But yet we do it all the time. And it's both parties, although the the, the Republican Party you know, probably much more so, but but the Democrats do the same thing, uh, mixing religion with politics. Uh, okay, that is the end of chapter 29. Thank you.